Now celebrating 22 and a half years of service to the amateur radio community around the world, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1171 of This Week in Amateur Radio. The Beauvais Island de-expedition is back on again as they negotiate with a new charter ship and begin planning anew. The ARRL is offering a free RF calculator online to help determine your station's RF exposure. The FCC approves FM operation on 11-meter citizens' band. The QSO Today virtual ham exposition is almost here. The Falkland Islands VP4 prefix is reportedly considered for dependencies. We will have all the details. A radio club in Utah receives an $18,000 grant to introduce and engage youth in amateur radio. The FCC announces another emergency alert systems test coming up. And Ofcom in the UK grants a power increase to Radio Caroline. We will have all the details and a news flashback to April of 2009, all straight ahead for you in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT on what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will have his word of the week, which this time has to do with the latest processor internal wiring measurements. He will tell us about GPS locations for warships at sea are being spoofed, and he will remind us to download software only from trusted sites, as spammers are spoofing some well-known download sites around the net. Australia's own Anno Benshop, VK6FLAB, says that the diversity of amateur radio is truly breathtaking. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill relates the story of why some amateur radio operators cannot drive down Weaver Street in Schenectady, New York. And our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will talk about the safest way to haul cargo up your tower. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in hot, sunny, humid Albany, New York, I'm George, W2XBS. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting from our news bureau in Rochester, New York, Along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from our radio station in the Catskill Mountains of upstate New York, where the garden cucumbers are taking over the pickle business, I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And reporting from our Troy, New York News Bureau, where the mosquitoes have won, I'm Eric, KD2RJX. And now with this week's lead story, here is Terry Saunders, N1KIN. Leading off the news this week, the Intrepid DX Group's plans for a 2023 de-expedition to Bouvet Island are back on the front burner again. With more details on take two of this de-expedition, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report from League Headquarters in Newington. The expedition co-leader Paul Ewing, N6PSE, announced this week that a new charter vessel contract is in the offing. The 3Y0J expedition has refunded all donations to its earlier announced plan, advanced before losing its contract with the charter vessel Braveheart. Braveheart Captain Nigel Jolly, K6NRJ, told the expedition in June that the Braveheart was being put up for sale and he was canceling its contract for the 3Y0J. Zero J voyage. Ewing said this week that the team has found a suitable and affordable vessel whose skipper is willing to take the group of a dozen DXers to Bouvet. They are negotiating the terms of that charter contract at present. A new application has been submitted to the Norwegian Polar Institute, Ewing said, and the team leadership has been revised. David Jorgensen, WD5COV, and Kevin Rowett, K6TD, will be co-leaders along with Ewing. Look for a new 3Y0J website soon. 
I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. Together, this leadership team will assemble 12 operators to make this vision a reality, Ewing said. We are revising our website and soon we'll begin fundraising for this renewed effort. He expressed gratitude for all the past sponsors of the Bouvet Island De-Expedition Initiative and said he hopes they can support the renewed effort as well. A new website is under construction. A dependency of Norway, Bouvet is a sub-Antarctic volcanic island in the South Atlantic. The Federal Communications Commission has adopted guidelines and procedures for evaluating environmental effects of RF emissions. Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, has more. Under the new FCC rules, some amateurs need to perform routine station evaluations to ensure that their stations comply with the RF exposure rules. ARRL now provides an RF exposure calculator on its RF exposure page to help determine the minimum safe distance between any part of your antenna and areas where people might be exposed to RF from your station. Although amateurs can make measurements of their stations, evaluations can also be done by calculation. The calculator is at arrl.org forward slash rf hyphen exposure hyphen calculator. To use it, enter your transmit peak envelope power or PEP and operating mode and answer the questions about the maximum amount of time you might be transmitting. The calculator will give you the minimum distance people must be from your antenna and human exposure. You can print the results and keep them in your station records. You don't need to send the results to the FCC. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. The FCC guidelines already incorporate two tiers of exposure limits based on whether exposure occurs in an occupational or controlled situation or whether the general population is exposed or exposure is in an uncontrolled situation. Once again, to use the calculator, enter your transmit peak envelope power and operating mode and answer the questions about the maximum amount of time you might be transmitting. The calculator will give you the minimum distance people must be from your antenna and human exposure. There is no requirement to send your results to the FCC. The U.S. Federal Communications Commission has approved the use of FM as an option for citizens band operators on the 11 meter band's 40 channels. The FCC adopted the change to Part 95 of its rules on August 3rd. The agency released a statement saying it believed manufacturers' addition to FM to their radios would likely improve operators' experience. The FCC said continuing to mandate AM capability while permitting dual modulation will benefit the CB radio user, will have additional modulation options while maintaining the basic character of the service. The FCC authorizes Citizens Band to operate on the 40 channels between 26.965 MHz and 27.405 MHz. Cobra Electronics, a leading manufacturer of Citizens Band equipment, has petitioned the FCC for this rule change. The United States National Society, the ARRL, reports that a new experimental station, Whiskey Lima 2 X-ray Uniform Papa, is transmitting WSPR, or Whisper, on 40.662 MHz in the 8-meter band. WSPR is a digital mode designed to operate at marginal signal levels over great distances. The ARRL says that Whiskey Lima 2 X-ray Uniform Papa is an FCC Part 5 experimental station operated by Lynn Holcomb, November India 4 Yankee in the state of Georgia. It's licensed to operate with up to 400 watts effective radiated power between 40.660 MHz to 40.700 MHz. A 2019 petition for rulemaking asked the FCC to create a new 8-metre amateur radio allocation on a secondary basis. The petition suggests the new band could be centred on an industrial scientific medical segment somewhere between 40.51 and 40.70 MHz. The spectrum between 40 and 41 MHz is currently allocated to the federal government and as such within the purview of the National Telecommunications and Information Administration. 
ARRL member Michelle Bradley, Kilo Uniform 3 November of Maryland, filed the petition on behalf of REC Networks, which she founded, and described in the petition as a leading advocate for a citizen's access to spectrum, including amateur radio spectrum. You could read the full ARRL story at www.arrl.org forward slash news and just search for 8 Meter Experimental Station. The QSO Today Virtual Ham Exposition is returning on the 14th and 15th of August and will be based on the original platform used for the successful expo that was held in August of last year. Organizer Eric Guth, 4Z1UG, host of the QSO Today podcast, said the move back to single-platform experience will avoid the widespread problems reported previously when the conference attempted to integrate two virtual convention platforms provided by different vendors. Eric said the platform known as VFairs has implemented such upgrades as a video meeting lounge and said he anticipates what he is calling a flawless user experience. He said he hopes to exceed the expectations of more than 14,000 attendees at the live online event. Eric said the platform will have a lobby, auditorium, exhibit hall, and lounges, as well as over 90 speaker presentations on eight tracks. For ticket information or to register, visit QSOTodayHamExpo.com. That's QSOTodayHamExpo, all one word. Dot com. The dilemma over assigning prefixes to amateurs operating from certain locations near the Falkland Islands continues. We have an update. Steve Richards, G4HPE, reporting from the headquarters of Southgate Amateur Radio News. Alan Victor Kilo 6 Charlie Quebec reports that due to an oversight in the new communications legislation recently introduced in the Falkland Islands, the Victor Papa 8 callsign prefix no longer applies to the former Falkland Islands dependencies, that's the Antarctic Peninsula, South Shetlands, South Orkneys, South Georgia and the South Sandwich Islands. This impasse has been going on since 2017, when the Falklands government abruptly stopped issuing Victor Papa 8 licenses to de-expeditions and other amateurs wishing to operate from the Antarctic, South Georgia and so on. The logical solution would be to allocate new prefixes to the former dependencies, and the strongest candidates would be Victor Papa 0 for the British Antarctic Territory because several nations already use 0 to indicate an Antarctic station, for example Victor Kilo 0, Delta Papa 0 and Hotel Foxtrot 0. And then to use Zulu Delta Zero for South Georgia and the South Sandwich Islands, because it is the southernmost of Britain's mid-Atlantic territories, the others being Zulu Delta 7, Zulu Delta 8 and Zulu Delta 9. Both of these prefixes are available and have never been allocated before. They're eminently suitable for these locations, and probably what most DXs would prefer. Note that British Antarctic Territory and South Georgia and the South Sandwich Islands are separate British overseas territories, and therefore each requires its own separate prefix. The Falkland Islands Communications Regulator has never invited any public consultation on this matter. Nevertheless, Victor Papa Zero and Zulu Delta Zero have been previously suggested to them as the logical choices for these rare DX locations. Unfortunately, these suggestions seem to have fallen on deaf ears. Instead, it's now rumoured that the Falklands government is about to revive a defunct Caribbean prefix, Victor Papa IV, which was formerly Trinidad and Tobago, and apply it to two separate British territories in the Antarctic by subdividing the suffix. Victor Papa IV Alpha would be used for South Georgia and the South Sandwich Islands, and Victor Papa IV Bravo for the Antarctic Peninsula, South Orkneys and South Shetlands. If you think that resurrecting a defunct Caribbean prefix for use in the Antarctic and subdividing the suffix is a really bad idea and wish to lobby for a proper solution with new prefixes to be implemented, you should contact the Falkland Islands government officials as soon as possible and make your sentiments known. The relevant email addresses are regulator.telecoms at sec.gov.fk and head of legal services at sec.gov.fk. Alan Victor Kilo 6 Charlie Quebec says that if the worldwide amateur radio community shouts loudly enough, we just might get a couple of new prefixes and a satisfactory resolution to this ongoing five-year-old stalemate. 
The VP-8 prefix ceased to be used in those regions recently as a result of new communications legislatures in the Falklands. VP-8 licenses were formerly used by de-expeditioners wishing to activate South Georgia and the South Sandwich Islands, as well as the Antarctic Peninsula, South Orkneys, and South Shetlands. There has been no public consultation sought by the Falkland Islands Communications Regulator on this issue. The British Antarctic Territories, South Georgia, and South Sandwich Islands cannot issue their own licenses or assign call signs. Ofcom in the UK has left the option open for those locales to ask the Falkland Islands to administer licensing and call signs on their behalf, as has been the case up until early 2020. The report, which appeared on several news websites, is credited to de-expeditioner Alan Shesher, VK6CQ slash VP8BJ. A new Kiwi SDR remote receiver in Iceland covers all of the amateur HF bands from 160 to 10 metres. The Icelandic National Radio Society, IRA, reports that the Kiwi SDR receiver was removed from its original location last April and has been stored ever since by Erling Tango Foxtrot 3 Echo. However, on July the 30th, it was moved to a new location. The location is a mountain in the southwest of Iceland, known for cross-country skiing and hiking. The receiver is now located inside a heated house and uses a 70-metre-long wire antenna for the amateur bands from 160 to 10 metres. The counterpoise kit from the Ultimax 100 antenna is being used to lower the virtual resistance at the feed point. IRA members Ari Tango Foxtrot 1 Alpha and George Tango Foxtrot 3 Golf Zulu made the trip to the mountain and completed the installation. They believe that the current installation should ensure the smooth operation of the receiver on the mountain. The URL of the new SDR is bla.utvarp.com. That's Bravo Lima Alpha. Uniform Tango Victor Alpha Romeo Papa. Com. And there are two other Kiwi SDR receivers active already in Iceland. The IRA says thanks to Ari, TF1A, and George, TF3GZ, for their valuable contribution. This is an important new facility for radio amateurs who experiment with these frequency ranges, as well as listeners and anyone interested in propagation of radio waves. Also, thanks must go to Erling, Tango Fox 3 Echo, for keeping the receiver safe since last April. For more information about the new SDR, go to the IRA pages tinyurl.com forward slash IARU hyphen Iceland. And now it's time for our weekly news flashback, as chosen by our official news curator, John W2JSF. This week we flash back to April of 2009 for a story about a QSL card that was lost in limbo for 50 years. And reporting this week from our Traveling News Bureau in Colorado Springs, Colorado, I'm Nick Grimmig. George Hitz, W1DA, of Sudbury, Massachusetts, can finally account for one of his QSL cards, one he sent in 1956. While a newly licensed teenager living in Deland, Florida, Hitz, then KN4DPI, fired up his Johnson Viking Adventurer transmitter and made contact with Dave, KN6MSI, on 40 meters. Like a good operator, Hitz sent off a QSL card addressed only to Amateur Radio, KN6NMI, Chief Op Dave, address unknown, Riverdale, California. This turned out to be David Levin, later WI6J, who became a silent key in 2003. I was 14, and like me, Dave was the new ham and he wasn't in the call book, Hitz told ARRL. I hoped there would be someone at the Riverdale Post Office that would know who Dave was and it would get to him. But Hitz made one mistake. He addressed the card to Riverdale instead of Dave's actual QTH, Riverside. That simple error left the card sitting in QSL limbo from 1956 until now. In 1956, I was just a novice operator with a primitive station and even more primitive operating skills, Hitz explained. Back then, with my radio built from a kit and my BC-348 World War II Army Air Corps surplus receiver, and a 60-foot long wire antenna that was 15 feet high, California was like a whole other country, and I needed that California QSL. Hitz had put a return address on his card, but for reasons perhaps best known to the U.S. Postal Service, it finally was returned to his former Florida address in early April. 
It turned up in the mailbox of Mac McCormick, a non-ham now living in Hit's childhood home. The card apparently had been in the Twilight Zone for 50 years, McCormick said. It's not wrinkled or anything. McCormick offered to return the card to Hits, but Hits declined. What would I do with it, he said. I understand the guy who found it is going to frame it and place it on his coffee table. The story of the long-lost QSL card received worldwide attention. The press has run wild with this, Hits said. I heard the story has been in newspapers in India, Iceland, Ireland, all over the world, over 100 countries. It's almost like I could have DXCC from all the countries that have reported it. I'm Nick Grimmig. The Bridgerland Amateur Radio Club in northern Utah has received a nearly $18,000 grant from the nonprofit Amateur Radio Digital Communications to fund the club's initiatives to engage and educate youth in amateur radio through hands-on space science activities. With more on the club's plans for the grant, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, reporting from League Headquarters. In 2019, ARDC announced that it would use the proceeds from its sale of some 4 million unused consecutive AmperNet internet addresses to fund its operations and to establish a program of grants and scholarships to support communications and networking research with a strong emphasis on amateur radio. Bridgerland ARC has set out an 18-month timeline of proposed activities. These would include an amateur radio on the International Space Station or ARIS contact between students in a local school and a member of the ISS crew. Also, hands-on workshops to build and launch a high-altitude balloon and amateur radio payload, and youth-oriented hands-on operating events. Numerous amateur radio organizations and projects have benefited from ARDC's largesse. In 2020, the ARRL Foundation received a $200,000 scholarship matching grant. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. This grant and our Bridgerland Amateur Radio Club demonstrate the important role amateur radio can play in furthering STEM education, which is critical to continuing Utah's high-tech economy, said Utah Section Manager Pat Mallon, N7PAT, who came into office on July 1st. Mallon said prime movers behind the grant initiative include Jason Peterson, K7EM, Club President Ted MacArthur, AC7II, and Club Secretary Kevin Reeve, N7RXE. Mallon just appointed Reeve as the Section Youth Coordinator. Where local schools do not have the equipment to make this a possibility, the Bridgerland Amateur Radio Club is prepared to set up and maintain a portable ground station and provide the expertise to help local schools make ISS contacts. The initiative would also provide educational and enjoyable hands-on activities. A component of this initiative would include training local radio amateurs to use the ground station equipment to prepare them to mentor students and apply the necessary skills to help run the activities. The Amateur Radio Digital Communications has said that it intends to award a total of several million dollars in grants of varied amounts to qualified beneficiaries to be used in accordance with ARDC's mission. Numerous amateur radio organizations and projects have benefited from ARDC's largesse. In 2021, these included nearly $82,000 to W8EDU at Case Western Reserve University for tower placement, some $88,400 to the Oregon Hamwan Backbone Project, and $23,600 to Ares LAX Incorporated for sophisticated RF interference location equipment. The Irish Radio Transmitters Society reports that devices called Vassa Matrix, sold by a Swiss company of the same name, have been identified as the source of interference at around 144.015 MHz right across Europe. The manufacturer claims that the device will vitalise, structure and energise water, thus making drinking water healthier and curing a wide range of diseases, from oncologic and virologic to orthopaedic ailments. Following complaints, those devices have now been banned from sale in Germany after an investigation by the local communications regulator, BNETSA. Complaints included direct identification of these devices near Frankfurt Airport. The devices use an unstable power oscillator around 144.015 MHz with a wide noise skirt and produce 20 watts output power for a period of over five minutes. Strong harmonics can be heard at 288 and 432 MHz. For the user of the water purifier, this translates into a calculated electromagnetic field exposure of about 28 volts per meter, which is enough to possibly upset a heart pacemaker. Earlier this year, 
The AMSAT Board of Directors adopted a set of strategic satellite objectives and organizational goals for 2021 to 2035. The plan, adopted in early June and published for members to see in the May-June 2021 edition of the AMSAT Journal, establishes what AMSAT describes as a long-term, multifaceted vision that includes big dreams, a continued presence in space, and a development path for the scientists, engineers, and operators of tomorrow. Anything this ambitious will undoubtedly challenge our limited human and fiscal resources, remarked AMSAT President Robert Bankston, KE4AL. We must parallel our new plan with new ways to manage and fund projects. AMSAT has a pool of very talented volunteers, but there will be times when we require skills beyond our current capabilities, recruitment, partnerships, collaborative efforts, and even outsourcing are options that will help us fill the gaps. The list of long-range satellite objectives includes putting amateur radio spacecraft into highly elliptical orbits. According to the AMSAT journal, this entails developing and deploying a series of satellites capable of providing wide area and continuous coverage from highly elliptical and geostationary transfer orbits. This means satellites in highly elliptical orbits will be readily accessible or at least accessible for longer periods. The GOLF, or Greater Orbit Larger Footprint Initiative, has a similar but less lofty objective. The GOLF program intends to field a series of increasingly capable spacecraft through a program to learn skills and systems for which we do not yet have the necessary low-risk experience, including active attitude control, deployable and steerable solar panels, and radiation tolerance for commercial off-the-shelf components in higher orbits and propulsion. As an amateur radio on the International Space Station partner, AMSAT would work with ARIS and ARIS USA to advance amateur radio's presence aboard the International Space Station and beyond to the Deep Space Gateway and Artemis missions, which would provide opportunities to engage with astronauts in lunar and deep space operations. AMSAT will continue to embrace low-Earth orbit satellite projects. AMSAT's strategic plan calls for the organization to support a stream of LEO satellites developed in cooperation with the educational community and other amateur radio satellite groups. FM Voice 1U CubeSats in low-Earth orbit would continue to be a part of the mix. Other objectives call on AMSAT to develop a plug-and-play communications solution for educational and other amateur radio CubeSat programs, providing a VHF-UHF telemetry beacon, command receiver, and linear transponder or FM repeater communications module. AMSAT also aims to support science, technology, engineering, and mathematics initiatives and training programs for satellite and ground system designers and operators. In the same vein, AMSAT hopes to develop an educational outreach program that encourages youth to pursue STEM interest in space science and communication technology, continue development of AMSAT's CubeSat simulator program, and develop a program to support and sponsor the use of amateur radio in high-altitude balloon launches. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Our 17th year of tech guying. So I just noted that TikTok had 3 billion downloads. How many people are in the U.S.? 350 million? How many people in the world? 7 billion? 3 billion downloads. Now, I mean... That's not 3 billion unique users because I know I've downloaded a few times myself personally. You know, I do that with TikTok. I download it. I install it. I play with it. I wake up. I, you know, suddenly realize I've been TikToking for the last four and a half hours. The guy comes on and says, hey, you really, you need to go to bed. They, they, they literally, if, you, if you're on it long enough, TikTok puts up a, a video that says, get a drink of water, take a walk. You know, you, you've been really uh, on this for a long time. <laughs> when I see that guy, I go, oh, 
I better go to sleep. I got to work in the morning. When that happens a couple of times, I delete TikTok in a rage. No more TikTok for me. And then I reinstall it a month later. And then I, it's a rinse, slather, repeat kind of a thing. It's a love-hate relationship. So that's why 3 billion downloads. I bet you half those people have downloaded it just like me and deleted it and downloaded it and deleted it. Last week I had a word of the week. I thought I'm not going to do this every week. Don't worry. It's not a it's not a regular feature. But there is a word of the week this week, I thought, that is kind of new. It's angstrom. Yeah, angstrom. A-N-G-S-T-R-O-M. Swedish word. So the A has a little halo over it. And the O has an umlaut. So it's probably pronounced Angström. It's named after a guy, I'm sure. It is 100 millionth of a centimeter, 10 billionth of a meter. Why would we care about it? You know, you, you, it's such a tiny little thing. You measure the wavelength of light in angstroms. It's several hundred angstroms. What would we care about angstroms for? Because it's the new measure of processors you're going to hear about. I don't know, have you been following this at all? When we talk about the CPU, the microprocessor, actually GPU too, any of the processors in your computers or phones or tablets or, you know, uh, any, you know, microwave, they often talk about the size of the wires in that thing, which is really better represented by the number of transistors or the transistor density or something like that. But for some reason, we measure the size of the wires and they've gotten smaller and smaller. Intel's microprocessors are 10 nanometers, 10 billionths of a meter. Is that right? Nano, billion. Uh, yeah, I have to remind myself of the international system of units every time. You've got a meter, which is about a yard, right? A centimeter, which is a hundredth of a meter. You know, in the other direction, kilometer is a thousand meters, right? So centimeter is a hundredth of a meter. Millimeter is a hundredth of a centimeter or a thousandth of a meter, and it goes down from there. A nanometer is pretty small. It's so it's small, it's thinner than a hair. Yeah. No, it's super, it's super small. So let's see. You got centi, milli, micrometer. Okay, that's a millionth of a meter. Nanometer, which is a billionth or a millardeth of a meter. Pico is the next one, but we're not going to use picometer. We're not going to use picometer in measuring these chips. So Intel's 10 nanometers, some 14. ARM and some other processors are now getting smaller. TSMC is making uh, processors that are the equivalent of 4 nanometers. In fact, they just they're starting to build a plant for 2 nanometers. Well, pretty soon you got you got to go to a new measurement cuz you got 1 1 nanometer what it, then what's next? So, what's next? Well, it should be picometer, but we're going to instead we're going to go to angstrom. That's the word of the week, angstrom. So you're going to start seeing uh, processors using a 20A, and it'll be an A with a little halo over it, Twenty, like the Anaheim Angels, little A, oh, and a little halo over it. That is an angstrom, one ten billionth of a meter. There you go. That's the number. One ten billionth of a meter. So 20 angstroms is actually two nanometers. and But that way we can get down to 10 angstroms, five angstroms, two angstroms. I don't know what we're going to do after that. They get so small... Pretty soon you're, I mean, you're well below, you're subatomic now. Angstroms measure the distance between atoms and material and things. I mean, it's tiny. Why is this important? Well, really, the, the really important measurement, which nobody uses, is density of transistors on these chips. The more transistors you can get on these chips, the more powerful they are. In fact, that's the very famous Moore's Law that was coined, you know, back in the, I don't know, 60s? Moore, Gordon Moore was a... Um, engineer at uh, one of the early microprocessor companies and then later went to uh, Intel. He created up Moore's Law. He was the chairman and founder of uh, Intel. And Moore's Law for a long time drove computers. It was actually the most important, probably the most important thing in technology, even though no one's ever heard of it. Well, geeks have. Moore's Law held that the number of transistors on a processor would double every year and a half, every 18 months. And it held true for a long time. Now, if you double and double that and then double that and double that, that's big, right? That's a big growth. And in fact, the latest uh, M1 processor from Apple, which is pretty small. <laughs> it's about the size of, a, I don't know, your fingernail, your pinky fingernail. It has 16 billion, 
with a B, transistors on it. That's roughly a measurement of its power. You know, the, uh, uh, the Intel, let's see, the first PC was built on an Intel 8088 microprocessor. And its, its transistor count, its transistor count was uh, 29,000, 29,000. And so that's the point is that this number has doubled every year and a half for the last 30 or 40 years. We're actually kind of at the end of Moore's Law. You can't keep doing that. But it's pretty impressive. You got 16 billion. So we went from the earliest days of computing. The Macintosh, first Macintosh, had a processor with 68,000 transistors. So the first Mac had 68,000 transistors in its processor. The current Mac has, what did I say? I forgot already. These numbers, 16 billion. That's a, that's a big shift, isn't it? That's a lot. And, and that roughly equates to the power of the processor. So I just, the word of the week is angstrom because we're going to start hearing these 20A, they're talking about 20A processors. That's the equivalent of two nanometers. I'm letting you know ahead of time, a word of warning. You can add that to your geek dictionary. Actually, we, you know, Intel kind of ran out of steam on this. And that's why they started, because the processors were getting so hot. You know, usually when you get it smaller, it's cooler. But Intel just had trouble making those. So instead of uh, making them smaller, they just put more transistors in it, more uh, processors in a chip. So that's why we talk about, you know, four core and eight core and dual core processors. Because instead of just making them smaller and faster, they just put more of them on there. Which is not quite the same. Not quite the same. I'm sorry I even I'm sorry I even started. It's just I I find this to me maybe that's why I'm in this business. I find that fascinating that you go from a chip with, you know, the first Mac with 68,000 processors to the current Mac or transistors in the processor, 68,000 transistors in the processor to the current Mac with a lot more. 60 what did I say? I keep forgetting. Huge. It's just it's mind-boggling. 16 billion transistors in the chip. It's mind-boggling. 16 billion transistors in the chip. Your phone, in your pocket, if you have a late model iPhone, say you have an A14 in there, the Bionic, 11.8 billion. I mean, you're, we're talking a lot of, we're, that's powerful stuff. Powerful. Powerful. Uh, let's see, what else can we talk about? Uh, Phantom Warships. Big problem. This is a new... So we, we're really seeing that warfare between nations or conflict or strife or struggle is between nations is increasingly not fought on the battlefield but on the in the, in the cyber space. And this is a good example. Spoofing GPS coordinates and AIS transponders. It, by international law, almost every vessel on the sea, all the commercial vessels anyway have to have a little doohickey in there called AIS that automatically, it's the automatic identification system. It's designed to prevent collisions at sea, but automatically shows where a vessel is. But over the last year, over 100 warships, battleships, from at least 14 countries, Russia and the U.S., have had their locations faked. This started in August of last year. 400 vessels... I'm sorry, 100 vessels. Some of these tracks show warships approaching foreign naval bases or intruding into disputed waters. They're not, but they look like they're creating acts of war. We've seen GPS spoofed. We've seen AIS spoofed. And I guess that's what... Ha I, but who's doing it? I don't know. Hackers are doing it. It first started with the illegal fishing vessels hiding their location, right? But warships? It's a brave new world. Brave new world. It's interesting. Hacking is really... I mean, that's ransomware has been used as a tool now, I think, of nation states to attack one another, chiefly Russia to attack us. We've seen Russian malware on, uh, on, our, on our electrical grid, in the power stations. Eesh. Yikes. Uh, a word of warning. I like to put these out so that you are prepared. Be careful where you download stuff. There's a browser. I like it a lot. I use it called Brave. It's a privacy browser. Scammers have been putting fake copies of Brave on the internet. And unless you're paying close attention, it might be an easy thing for you to fall for. They buy Google ads linking to a site that looks like Brave, but is not. It's Brave, but the E, instead of being a regular E, has a, a cute accent over it. 
But if you look at it, especially if you don't look really carefully, it would look like Brave.com to you. It's not. It's a malware site. It looks exactly like the Brave website. And when you download it, what you're getting is not a browser, but in fact, a malware payload. So when you, uh, so if, I've said this before, I'm going to reiterate this. A lot of times we get in trouble or we want a new browser, or we want some anti-malware tools, or we're just trying to figure out what's hijacking my system. And we do a Google search. Really be careful when you look at the results of that search that you're going to the right place, the place you think you're going. I mean, you got to be extra careful because, of course, what better way for a bad guy to infiltrate your system than to fake a well-known site, say Microsoft.com, Maybe it's Microsoft.com. Put a little umlaut over Microsoft.com, and uh, and download a payload onto your system. Be very careful. Be very careful. There are a number of sites like this. There's FlightSimulator.com. You like Telegram? I like Telegram. Nice little messenger. Do not get it from Telegram.com. Get it from Telegram.com. Now, of course, as soon as people found out about this, they went to the went to Google. Said, "You, you see what's happening here?" And Google took those ads down. They went to the domain. Host for Brave.com took it down. Doesn't matter. These guys keep doing it, and it, it happens fast. And uh, so be careful. I'm just saying that. Be extra careful when you're downloading. Actually, really, the rule, I'm going to really uh, reiterate this again and again, I think, of, as, as time goes by. Never install software you don't need. Don't go... You know, it used to be in the old days, it was kind of part of the fun of having a computer is looking at shareware and freeware and downloading stuff and installing stuff. Everything you install on your system opens the door, potentially opens the door for malware. Be very, very careful and don't install it unless you absolutely need it. And if you're going to get it, get it from a trusted site. Check the certificate. Click the little lock on there and make sure it's really the site you think it is. Just going to have to do that because the bad guys are very ingenious. Anyway, I'm glad you were here, and I'm here, and I'll be here next week, and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends, too, as we talk high-tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment to explain why real hams can't drive down Weaver Street. Welcome to the Ancient Amateur Archives. I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY. Three memorable events occurred in my life in 1971. I turned 18, I graduated from high school, and I passed my general. To celebrate, I bought myself an old VW bus and installed radios for 11, 10, 6, and 2 meters. Thus began my lifelong love of mobile operations. I soon encountered a problem. The VW bus was 76 inches tall. With four antennas on the roof, my total height was 136 inches, or 11 feet 4 inches. I had a park on the street, as the driveway at my parents' house had an 8-foot clearance by the back door. Parking garages were now off-limits. Still, except for these two restrictions, I had no problems in getting around. My hometown, Buffalo, New York, is very flat and is laid out in a combination of a spoke and grid pattern. Clearances under railroad bridges were at least 12 feet. No street was off limits. Even when I upgraded to a Ford Econoline van, 80 inches tall, my overall height was only 11 feet 8 inches, low enough to make it under any bridge. I had a ball mobile, working hundreds of stations across town and across the world. When I moved to Albany, New York in the early 80s, however, I ran into trouble. Unlike Buffalo, the Capital District of New York is not centralized. It consists of three medium-sized cities and half a dozen smaller cities and villages hemmed in by hills, valleys, and two major rivers. It is also a far older area than Buffalo, filled with densely populated narrow streets that climb steep hills and twist and turn through small valleys. In many areas, there was simply no room to allow for adequate clearances under bridges. As a result, there are over 10 bridges with clearances less than 11 feet. 
One is just three blocks from my office. I had a choice, put on shorter antennas or learn alternate routes. I kept the antennas, of course. It wasn't hard to find other streets, and soon I thought I had the problem solved. Until I came to Weaver Street. I was living in Rotterdam, a suburb of Schenectady. According to the map, the shortest distance from point A, my house, to point B, downtown Schenectady, was down Weaver Street. I set out one day on a trip downtown. I never made it. I turned onto Weaver Street. One hundred feet later, I saw the sign and the bridge. The clearance, eight feet, nine inches. I came to a complete stop, with cars honking behind me. I couldn't believe it. Eight feet, nine inches on a major street? I made a U-turn and went home. I looked at the Ford van and I asked myself, are these antennas really worth it? I got in the van, drove around, and worked Scotland and the Virgin Islands repeater on 10 meter FM, came home and said, yes. And so I avoided Weaver Street. I eventually traded the van in for a Ford Escort wagon. The wagon was only 56 inches tall, but my problem actually became worse. For... At the same time I got the Escort, I also bought an ICOM 725 HF mobile rig and ham sticks for 75 through 10 meters. The ham sticks were 8 feet tall. With a 4-inch spring, my total height was now 13 feet. Dozens of streets were now off limits, not just because of low bridges, but also because of trees and even some cable or power lines. My parents had also moved to the Albany area, but, shades of 1971, I couldn't pull in their driveway thanks to a cable line only 11 feet high. Believe it or not, that wasn't the worst. The Escort was equipped with the ICOM HF rig, a 6-meter sideband radio, a dual-band mobile unit, a 10-meter FM rig, and a CB radio. How did I fit all of these in an Escort? Simple. I turned the front passenger seat into a radio platform. My two kids were young at the time, and they rode in the back seat. When we went out as a family, we took my wife's minivan. On the rare occasions we had to use my car, the wife and kids were crammed into the back of the Escort while the radios rode shotgun. Yes, they complained, but I had 37 states and 31 countries logged. The radios and antennas stayed. But times change, and life evolves. The ICOM developed a transmit problem, the tri-mag mount corroded, the kids were growing, and the escort was old. I traded in the old wife for a newer, vastly improved model, and got a great deal, and the escort for a Hyundai. The new car was smaller than the escort and had only two doors. For a change of pace, I decided on a radically different approach. The radio presence in the Hyundai would be minimal a dual-band HT, and a small CB. Both easily fit in the center console. A three-foot mag mount on the trunk and a dual-band glass mount were the only antennas. My new height was only 76 inches, or 6 feet 4 inches. New worlds were opened up to me. I discovered something called the drive through wherein one can purchase food or conduct banking business from the comfort of the driver's seat. I explored the inside of something called a parking garage and marveled at my ability to drive unimpeded through such a structure. I enjoyed the sensation of actually having my passenger sit next to me instead of somewhere behind me. And I drove down Weaver Street. I was scared. I watched my speedometer as I approached the bridge. 10, 20, 30 miles per hour. I braced for the impact, but nothing happened. People no longer stared at my car. My kids were no longer embarrassed to ride with me. My wife was happy. But I wasn't. There was a void in my life that couldn't be filled with QSOs on the local repeater. And I started to hear the whispers. The voices kept saying, If you call CQ, they will answer. Like I said earlier, times change and life evolves. My older daughter is now 17, has her driver's license and her own car. 
My driving patterns changed, and 99% of the time I drive alone or with only one passenger. In 2003, I turned 50. It was time for my midlife crisis. I bought a Yaesu FT8900 quad band rig and an ICOM IC718HF radio. I dug out my hamsticks. My coworker, Jim, KE2YZ, gave me a tri-mag mount. And so, one Saturday morning, I once again turned the front passenger seat into a radio platform and increased my vehicle's height to 13 feet. My younger daughter isn't too keen on riding in the back seat, and I got the look of death from my wife when she had a ride back there. Once again, I am banished from dozens of streets. I abandoned Weaver Street, the drive throughs and the parking garages without a backward glance. My car draws stares from people on the street. I can't pull in my parents' driveway anymore. Was it worth it? I check into e-cars and the 1010 net on a regular basis. I can work Europe on my 10-minute commute to work. And I can access 10-meter repeaters from Florida to Texas. For me, the answer is yes. The voices are satisfied, and I am complete. Your time is up. Go in peace. But return again for our next installment of the Ancient Amateur Archives. And now with our propagation report and taking a close-up look at Solar Cycle 25, here is Steve Richards, G4 Hotel Papa Echo, reporting from Southgate Amateur Radio News in the UK. As you may know, the sunspot activity on the sun rises and falls in an approximately 11-year cycle, and at the peaks of the cycle, the sun's enhanced influence on the ionosphere of Earth leads to much better shortwave propagation. In fact, it even improves low VHF propagation. Not bad from 93 million miles away. As you probably heard me moan more than once, the new cycle, cycle 25, seems to be tantalisingly slow to take off, but it will inevitably do so. So attention is now turning to how intense the peak will be. This is measured by a calculation known as the smoothed sunspot number, and NASA scientists are beginning to think that the forthcoming cycle may have a stronger peak than previously thought. Bob Marston, Alpha Alpha 6 X-ray Echo, reports that heliophysicists based at NASA's High Altitude Observatory at the University of Colorado have released a revised prediction for Solar Cycle 25. The report, generated by Ricky Egeland, a solar physicist working in the NASA Space Radiation Analysis Group, now suggests that the peak of the forthcoming Solar Cycle 25 will top out at a value of 195 plus or minus 17, based on the new scale for calculating the smoothed sunspot number. For reference, Solar Cycle 21 peaked at an SSN of 233, whilst Solar Cycle 23 peaked at an SSN of only 180. So, if this prediction holds up, ham radio will see excellent worldwide F-layer conditions on the 10-metre band for several years around solar maximum. 6-metre band conditions should be good in the equinox periods before and after solar maximum, with consistent openings on medium-haul polar routes. 6-metre routes traversing the equator should experience consistent openings plus or minus 9 months from solar maximum. Ricky Egland is a participating member in the group headed by Scott McIntosh and Bob Lehman that published a paper nine months ago outlining the existence of magnetic bands within the sun that govern the sunspot and hail cycles. At the time of its publishing, the paper went on to predict the peak of solar cycle 25 could be as high as solar cycle 21. Today's release is a revised prediction based on data observed since the original paper was published but the team say they can't be sure, as we are still in the early days of cycle 25. The solar rotation cycle, as marked by sunspot activity, was established on April 19th, 2021, so we're only 90 days into actually observing cycle 25. It's now agreed that the dramatic ramp-up in sunspot activity we experienced last autumn, whilst tied to cycle 25, was an outlier. 
The team's Autumn 2020 paper was about the so-called Terminator event, which they say might be an indicator of the next solar maximum. When asked whether the Terminator event had occurred, Scott McIntosh said that they can't be sure just yet, but they're very close to determining this. It should be noted that while it's been over a year since the Sun produced an old Cycle 24 region with a sunspot worthy of a NASA classification, the Sun has been steadily producing spotless active regions as part of the old cycle, the last of which formed right on the solar equator on July the 24th, 2021. These active regions are part of a solar cycle in its final stages of existence. They produce no spots and only last for a few hours before they dissipate away. Once the Solar Cycle 24 active regions cease forming, Solar Cycle 25 will take off in earnest. Time now for the AMSAT report. Looking for a few Echo Nancy grids? Mike N8MR will be in Echo Nancy 56, 57, and 67, August 7th to the 14th. He'll be using his ICOM IC9700 an arrow antenna with a SAT PC32 to control Doppler. Rick, WTJAZ, reported on August 1st that Mark, N8MH, one of the AMSAT command stations, was testing AO92. He reported a very solid signal on a maximum pass of 22 degrees. Might be worth giving that one satellite a shot. Use a 67 hertz tone for AO92. Next week, we'll talk about how to transmit into SO50 and have you making contacts like a pro. Practice by listening for the satellite. This will make it much easier to transmit and make a contact. And remember, never transmit to an FM satellite unless you can hear it. The AMSAT report comes to us each week, courtesy of Bruce Page, KK5DO. Effective this fall, the CQ Worldwide DX Contest will offer a new youth overlay Available to all competitors who are 25 years old or, or younger as of the dates of the event. The Cabrillo Overlay format will be Category-Overlay, Youth. To support this change, Youth Overlay entries will be highlighted in the results, as is now done in the case of Classic and Rookie entries. Plaques will be available for the winners in this category. CQWW has also established a new Explorer category, to allow amateurs to participate in the CQWW contest while experimenting creatively with internet-linked stations and other developing technologies. The goal is to encourage innovation in operating strategies, station design, and technology adaptation. CQWW contest director John Doerr, K1AR, reminds participants that audio recordings may be requested for your entry as part of the log checking process. Any single operator entrance competing for a top five finish at the world, continent, or U.S. levels, including classic overlay, must record the transmitted and received audio as heard by the operator for the duration of the contest operation. Failing to respond to this request may result in your log being reclassified or disqualified. The combination of embracing new technology as well as recognizing the youth community among us is going to make CQWW an even more popular event, Doris said. My thanks go out to the CQWW Contest Committee and others who helped make this happen. Recently, New Zealand's regulator RSM, standing for Radio Spectrum Management, successfully brought charges against radio operator Moko Turner, who was found guilty of possessing an unrestricted two-way radio. The prohibited radio was found in Mr Turner's vehicle by police officers during a routine pullover. On further analysis, the prohibited radio had police frequencies programmed into the unit and was able to transmit on police channels. Mr Turner appeared in Wangarai District Court and was found guilty of charges under the Radio Communications Act 1989. It is illegal for any person apart from New Zealand police to transmit on police channels. Unsolicited radio communications can cause serious harm and put officers and the New Zealand public in danger. Radio Spectrum Management takes a very serious stance against those who disrupt or cause interference to police or other emergency services. As floods from the recent monsoon in the western Indian state of Maharashtra swept through the villages, raising the death toll to nearly 200, amateur radio operators traded their radios for relief kits and dispersed through the villages in the Satara district to distribute help. The flooding late last month, which resulted in landslides and water levels surging to heights of 20 feet in some areas, 
prompted officials to undertake the state's largest flood evacuation in recent decades. The Satara Institute of Hams handed over more than 100 kits containing basic groceries, blankets, water, and medicine, according to postings on social media. Hams assisting in the assembly and distribution of the kits included Nairan Jan Supicar, VU3 GPX, Santanu Karande, VU3 GBZ, and Rohit Bosali, VU2 MIB stroke W2 MIB. Rohit said in an email that the ham radio team also helped establish communication between people in the affected area and officials in the local district administration. Writing on their Facebook page, the hams acknowledged the generosity of the action's benefactors. They wrote, Thank you, donors. This wouldn't have been possible without your support. Foundations of Amateur Radio You've heard me say that amateur radio is a thousand hobbies in one. It's not my idea, but it speaks to me in ways that are hard to articulate. Today, I found a way that might give you an inkling just how vast this community is. One place where our community gathers is on air, but it's not the only place. There are clubs, websites, email lists, video channels and other outlets, all catering for different amateur radio users and their interests. One such place is the social media site Reddit. In the so-called Amateur Radio sub, with currently over 88,000 members, there is a lively community discussing many of the different aspects of our hobby. Over the past 24 hours, 23 posts were made in that single community. Thanks Kilo 2722 Hunters was a photo about activating Carolina Beach State Park as part of an activity called Parks on the Air, or POTA. To participate, you can either go to a park, set up your station and make contacts, or you can stay at home and listen out for people who are doing that. It's not hi-hi, it's he-he, a meme around the sound that Morse code generates when you send the letter H followed by the letter I, commonly considered laughter. Why don't scanners have FM radio? A discussion around the perceived lack of FM mode on scanners. Help with TYT MD380 CPS, question from an amateur who purchased a new radio and is looking for software to program it. Portable on the Space Coast QRP on a speaker wire antenna. A video of an amateur making an activation in Florida and showing off their setup. Could not hit DMR repeater. An amateur sharing that they figured out that they couldn't hit a repeater because they had their radio set to low power and wanted to share that with the community. Antenna advice part two asking about how to set up antennas for dual use, how to amplify the signal, use rotators, and what kind of coax to use. ISS SSTV August 67145.800 MHz FM, linking to a news item announcing slow-scan television coming from the International Space Station in August. FT3DRAPRS message question. Exploring the specifics on how Automatic Packet Reporting System, or APRS, messages are sent. Think of it as global distributed SMS via amateur radio. Is it okay to leave a handheld radio on while it's on its battery charger 24-7? With answers to the question that's puzzling one owner of a radio. Extra test question, asking about how to learn for the test and wondering if the techniques needed are different when compared with obtaining the tech exam. Just got my first radio now to prep for the test, but first a question about saving time after I pass it. Asking about how to register before the test to speed things along. And that's just over halfway there. Maldol TMH21 TMH71 handhelds any info. Asking about a new to them radio from around 2007. 2021 Berryville VA US Hamfest. Any Reddit's community members going? looking for others going to the first ham fest in their region for a long time. CB Radio is going FM. Why is the FCC doing it? Linking to a video that discusses the changes on how CB Radio is getting another mode. What is the right way to learn Morse? The age-old question, one that I'm still working through. Side tone distorted on QCX Mini. How do I fix this? It gets better or worse when I move the radio around, but the problem doesn't go away. Anyone else's QCX do this? with a video showing the issue. Aluminium roof trim plus HF dipole, with a question on what kind of effects might happen as a result of the combination of the two.
Never owned a radio before, please help. Lol, I got two of these on the way. Any tips for beginners? Excited new owner looking for advice. I finally got my QSL cards printed, with pictures to show the artistic prowess involved. Legality of transmitting digital data over FM audio, asking about the specifics on how data may or may not be transmitted in the United States. It's no pie plate on a kayak, but you got to work with what you have, right? Showing off a frying pan as a magnetic base. If it works, it's not silly at all. Very new here, asking about how to explore radio waves. Those 23 different posts are all about amateur radio from one single community on one day. Each post from someone finding their way in the community, discussing something that's important to them, sharing their experience and contributing to that community. Reddit alone has at least a dozen amateur-related communities, covering electronics, specific radios, amateur software development, and more. The thing about this hobby is that it's different things to different people. For some, it's about getting on air and making noise. For others, it's learning about whatever comes their way. This hobby is so vast because it touches so many aspects of life. It innovates, leads, and contributes in ways that are often invisible, and that's why it's so engrossing. What's your latest interest in this hobby, and what keeps you coming back for more? I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. There are times when tower jobs we need to do require helpers assisting us on the ground and with us on the tower. These are special situations which require higher than normal levels of communication between team members. When hauling coax, antennas, sidearms, or other hardware up the tower, never hoist hardware up the tower with someone underneath the cargo, unless they're wearing the proper safety gear and have been trained in tower work. Let's face it, on a tower, you don't get a second chance. There are at least three sides to each tower. So keep the lower climber on a different side. And besides, a freestanding tower is happier when you spread the load more evenly. So before you start to do tower work with other climbers and ground crew, stop, take a moment, and discuss with everyone exactly what you intend to do. The goals to accomplish, the order the tasks will be done in, special hardware you may need, and a discussion about hoisting things up and down the tower. The guy on the ground should always have the job of keeping sidewalk supervisors away from the base area of the tower. Even a quarter twenty zinc plated nut falling 80 feet onto the top of an unprotected skull can leave a permanent dent, not to mention a thud that will be ringing for hours in the victim's head. There's a good argument here for wearing a hard hat. Few hams I know of own one or even know where to buy one, so the next best thing is only one person climbing at a time. If climbing with a person already strapped on working above you, choose a different side to climb on. If you're already on the tower, but the antenna you need to work on is like six feet out on a sidearm, a different set of rules apply. It is most likely that the sidearm is fully capable of holding your weight as is. My personal rule is to never totally trust any part of the tower. This includes sidearms. So I bring along my trusty 15-foot strap. This yellow strap is very lightweight but fully capable of pulling a snowbound car out of a ditch. I attach one end of this strap to my harness and the other to a tower leg about five feet or more above the point where the sidearm mounts. This strap is strong enough to catch the full weight of the sidearm, myself, and my cargo. If you're expecting to work on a sidearm, I strongly recommend you invest in one of these rescue type straps. Copy down my URL at the end of this segment if you don't know where to start looking for this type of information. Not only did I want this series to offer safety tips, I also wanted to offer hints to make the job go faster and easier. The way I figure, an easier climb is bound to be a safer climb. So let's cover a couple of quick hints. For your tower work, attach them to a short piece of fishing line. Use the woven multi-filament type. Make it long enough to tie a wrist strap in the other end and tie the other end to the tool you don't wish to drop. If you have a friend with a leather working hobby, a good Christmas present would be a whole bunch of these straps. You can keep your tools securely on your arm and in your hand with one of these straps. Remember to order them large enough to fit around your arm when you're wearing cold weather climbing gear. Another one of my favorites is my coaxial cable hanger. I bent the hook in a piece of reinforcing steel bar, the type used in concrete work and often sold at hardware stores. 
I bent a squared hook in one end, about three inches over and five inches back down, sort of like a giant fishing hook. I use electrical tape to hold the coax onto the rod, then I'm bringing up the tower as I climb. I secure about two feet of the coax to the rod. As I climb, I reach down, grab the hook, and lift it to a tower rung up as high as I can reach. Don't forget a short piece of rope to secure the coax hook to a loop on your climbing belt just in case you might drop it. Some people like to lift coax after they get to the antenna that it connects to. I've had problems with coax damage doing it this way, so this has worked fine for me. I stretch out the coax on the ground and the crew helps feed it up to me as I climb further. This would probably not work on very long lengths and may be unnecessary on shorter towers. Remember, any time you spend learning about tower safety is an investment in yourself. Education is a big part of tower safety. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. Earth is entering a stream of debris from giant comet 109P Swift Tuttle, source of the annual Persid meteor shower. Although it doesn't peak until mid next week, the shower is already active. Last night alone, NASA cameras detected more than a dozen fireballs over the USA. As always, spaceweather.com has lots of detail. 109P Swift Tuttle is a huge comet with a broad debris stream. It takes Earth weeks to cross it. The shower will probably be most intense on August the 11th and 12th, that's Wednesday night into Thursday morning, when our planet is closest to the stream's dusty core. Adjacent nights could be almost equally as good. So, when should you look? Persids may be seen any time after about 10pm. Rates increase sharply around local midnight when the constellation Perseus is high in the sky. Observers in dark sky sites can expect to count dozens of meteors during the moonless hours before sunrise. So get away from the city lights, as light pollution kills meteors. Although the Navajo Nation in Arizona remains closed as a result of COVID-19 precautions, the annual special event station honoring the Navajo Code talkers of World War II will be on the air as scheduled between the 10th and 14th of August. This is the 17th annual celebration of the Native American members of the military who thwarted Japanese interception of their messages by using their language and their coded transmissions in the South Pacific. The special event station, N7C, will operate instead from the home QTHs of Ray, W7USA, Bob, K7BHM, John, W5PDW, and Herb, N7HG. Herb's father, John Goodluck, was among the original 29 code talkers in the United States Marine Corps who developed the code, passed in 2000 at the age of 76. Be listening for N7C on 40, 20, and 17 meters. For additional details and QSL information, visit the station's page on qrz.com. The developer of a popular CW trainer used around the world has become a silent key. Ray Burlingame Goff, G4FON, was the author of a computer-based trainer best known by his home call sign. He also held the U.S. call sign N4FON and the German call sign DG4FON. Ray's software, which uses the Koch method, is credited with helping train thousands of amateurs to copy and send Morse code. Ray's website, G4FON.net, notes that he was first licensed in 1973 as G8HMH, a Class B license with VHF privileges. By 1976, he'd become proficient in Morse code and in November of that year passed the code test that enabled him to upgrade to a Class A license and receive a new call sign. He moved to the United States briefly in the 1980s, using a call sign G4FON-W9 in Chicago and G4FON-W1 in Boston. Much later, he gained his U.S. and German call signs. According to his website, Ray's other amateur radio interests included contesting and homebrewing. In November of 2006, Ray was nominated to join the prestigious First Class CW Operators Club, becoming member number 1874. Meanwhile, a lifelong New Zealand ham whose name was among the many inscribed on a microchip aboard NASA's Mars rover in 2012 also has become a silent key. George Brewer, ZL3PN, died on July 4th. He was a life member of the South Canterbury Amateur Radio Club, where he had served as president. He had also been an amateur radio emergency communications section leader and repeater trustee. A ham since the age of 16, he marked the occasion of his 60 years in amateur radio with a special event call sign ZL60PN in 2010. And an Austrian journalist and children's book author, who was also an avid radio amateur, has become a silent key. 
Wolf Harrant, OE1WHC, who founded the DocuFunk archive in Vienna, died on Tuesday, August 3rd, following a short illness. The archive, which began as a QSL card collection, contains more than 9 million artifacts relating to radio communications, history, and amateur radio. The nonprofit organization has been supported by individuals, broadcasters, and radio associations for more than three decades. Wolf was perhaps best known among shortwave listeners of Radio Österreich International, where he was a popular presenter. Wolf would have been 80 on August 19th. Weak signal propagation reporting, or WISPR, is undergoing some refinements to help in the search for Malaysia Airlines Flight 370, which crashed more than seven years ago in the Indian Ocean while en route to Beijing. The low-power digital communications protocol used by radio amateurs to test propagation is now being employed by aerospace engineer Richard Godfrey in conjunction with a system he developed known as Global Detection and Tracking of Aircraft Anywhere, Anytime. There will be some preliminary tests in conjunction with Qantas airliner data before a different blind test is conducted later this year using the Malaysia Airlines data. The goal is to see whether tracking with help from the Global Detection and Tracking of Aircraft Anywhere, Anytime system can be more successful this time around. According to an article in AirlineRatings.com, the test will take place in October and November with an eye toward ultimately finding the exact crash location. Two separate searches for wreckage after the 2014 crash came up empty, although more than 30 pieces of debris has washed up in various places around the world. ARRL member Faith Hanalee KD3Z of Palm Coast, Florida, has been selected as the 2021 Bill Pasternak WA6ITF Memorial Amateur Radio Newsline Young Ham of the Year. Faith Hannah comes from an all-ham family. She is the daughter of James Lee, WX4TV, and Michelle Lee, N8ZQZ. Her brother and two sisters are also hams. She credited her parents with being the biggest influences in her entry into amateur radio at the age of 10 in 2014. Just 18 months after being licensed, Faith Hanna was invited to join the 2016 Dave Coulter Memorial Youth DX team, which operated from the Saba station of Jeff Jolly as PJ6 stroke NM1Y. And that's when I realized especially that DXing is amazing, because I absolutely love those huge pileups and getting to talk to all of those different people she explained. Among her PJ6 achievements was a satellite contact that broke the SO50 distance world record. Her account of the event appeared in the March-April 2017 issue of the AMSAT Journal. In August 2018, Faith Hanna took part in the week-long Youngsters on the Air camp in Johannesburg, South Africa, where she participated in kit building, antenna projects, satellite operation, and a high-altitude balloon launch. An article about her experiences in South Africa appeared in CQ magazine. On the way to South Africa, Faith Hanna and her father had a 22-hour layover in Dubai, the United Arab Emirates. While there, they were invited by the Emirates Amateur Radio Society to visit and operate A62A and A60YOZ. In December 2018, Faith Hanna, her younger sister Hope, ND2L, and their father organized a 36-hour mini-D expedition to the Dry Tortugas in the Gulf of Mexico off the southwest coast of Florida, where they operated as N4T. The family team put 1,970 HF contacts and 100 satellite contacts into the log. CQ published Faith Hanna's account of the N4T operation, and she and Hope shared the April 2019 cover of the magazine. Faith Hanna earned an associate degree from Daytona State College at age 15 and currently attends Stetson University in DeLand, Florida, where she is a member of the junior class. She maintains a 4.0 grade point average while working toward two separate bachelor degrees in molecular and cellular biology and business administration. She is considering two possible career tracks, medicine or law, 
or possibly both. Electronic Notes has begun to develop a virtual museum and directory of various vintage radios. It may include everything from crystal sets to early tube radios, government and military gear, and ham radio equipment up to the early solid state era. Each radio gets a description, details of the specifications, and a circuit where possible. Some already in the database include the Philco 111 Super Heterodyne from 1931, some of the Echo Art Deco round radio sets from the 1930s to 40s, a selection of government surplus radios such as the AR-88, the Marconi C-R100 and 150, and some ham radio equipment and a Tanberg radio from the 70s. As you can imagine, this is very much a work in progress, so we'll be adding more as time permits, so that we can end up with a useful selection of radios that people will find interesting to browse and read about, the website said. Meanwhile, FEMA, FEMA, in coordination with the FCC, will conduct a nationwide test of the emergency alert system and wireless emergency alerts this month. The national test will consist of two segments to test EAS and WEA, both tests are set to begin at 1820 UTC on Wednesday, August 11th. The WEA portion of the test will be directed only to consumers' cell phones, where the subscriber has opted to receive the test message. The EAS portion of the test will be sent to radios and televisions. This will mark the sixth nationwide EAS test. The purpose of the August 11th test is to ensure that EAS and WEA systems continue to be effective means of warning the public about emergencies. Taking island hopping a step further, Jan Foxtrot Oscar Stroke Foxtrot One Sierra Mike Bravo will be visiting seven French Polynesia islands until the 23rd of August. He's currently operating from Maria, islands on the air reference Oscar Charlie 046, and from the 6th onwards he plans to operate for a few days each from Taha, Bora Bora, Tikahau, Bangiroa, Fakarava, and finally from Tahiti. He works QRP, meaning low power, on single sideband and FT8, mainly on 7.090, 7.055 and 7.047 MHz in the 40 meter amateur band, and in the 20 meter band he operates on 14.285, 14.260, and 14.074 MHz. QSL is via Foxtrot 1 Sierra Mike Bravo for single sideband and via EQSL for single sideband and FT8. And Bruce Zulu Lima 1 Alpha Alpha Oscar is once again heading back to the South Cook Islands. He's planning to activate Atiu Island, IOTA reference Oscar Charlie 083, between August the 6th and the 9th, and Rarotonga Island, Oscar Charlie 013, between August the 9th and the 19th, using the call sign Echo 51 Alpha Alpha Oscar. Activity will be holiday style, mainly on 40 and 20 metres single sideband. You'll need to get up early in Europe, as the most likely place to find him is on the ANZA DX net, that's 14183 kHz at 0515 UTC, and he'll probably hang around after the net for some more contacts. His transceiver will be a Yesu FT857D with 75 to 100 watts output, depending on the available power supply, into a SOTABEAM's linked dipole. QSL is via Zulu Lima 1 Alpha Alpha Oscar, either direct or via the Bureau. He's not sure about using Clublog yet, and there will be no Logbook of the World or website. Bruce says that he's unlikely to have internet access from Atiu. He may have occasional email via mobile phone when on Rarotonga. This is a holiday-first type operation, so DXing will take second place. The new book, More Arduino for Ham Radio, by popular author and experimenter Glenn Popiel, KW5GP, builds on the success of his two previous titles, Arduino for Ham Radio and More Arduino Projects for Ham Radio. More Arduino for Ham Radio introduces many of the new Arduino boards and add-on modules, followed by an overview of the software, tools, and techniques needed to bring projects to life. These concepts are put to work in 10 practical projects that showcase a wide variety of applications and include detailed descriptions of how the software sketches work. Each is complete as is, with ideas for you to add your own personal touches 
or create your own projects using the techniques and modules presented. That's part of the fun of the Arduino and open source communities, building on the work of others, and then sharing your designs and innovations for others to learn, modify, and improve. Here's the current listing of upcoming ARRL Learning Network webinars. These webinars are a members only benefit. To register, check on upcoming webinars and view previously recorded sessions, log on to the ARRL Learning Network webinar page. Introduction to DMR and Digital Voice, hosted by Tim Deegan, KJ8U, will be presented on Thursday, September 9th, 2021, at 3.30 p.m. Eastern, that's 1930 UTC. An introductory overview of digital voice technologies for ham radio. This presentation will focus on DMR with notes on System Fusion, D-Star, and more. Included will be a description of digital voice architecture and components and the interesting opportunities and challenges that digital voice presents. ARRL members may register for upcoming presentations and view previously recorded learning network webinars. ARRL affiliated radio clubs may also use the recordings as presentations for club meetings, mentoring new and current hams, and discussing amateur radio topics. The ARRL learning network schedule is subject to change. And finally this week, a power increase has been agreed for Radio Caroline to extend its coverage area from Suffolk and Essex to include Kent and East Sussex in the UK. The station is broadcasting under a community radio license and was originally granted one kilowatt of power on 648 AM in 2018. The actual power increase amount has not been announced. Ofcom says a power increase was agreed to combat man-made noise and interference in the existing coverage area and to extend coverage to adjoining areas. While the subsequent increase in the licensed area was considered to be significant, the decision maker deemed there to be exceptional circumstances in order to approve this request, saying the service has experienced high levels of background noise and interference, particularly in urban areas. The licensee also serves a community of interest as opposed to a defined geographic community, meaning the service is positioned to be accessible to the community of interest in the proposed extended areas. Ofcom adds, there is an affinity between the existing and extended coverage area as the CPATH from the existing transmitter at Orford means the service is already receivable in parts of the extended coverage area, although existing reception is currently poor. Furthermore, the studio location means that the station attracts and engages volunteers from both the existing and extended coverage areas. The power increase will therefore improve signal in the extended coverage area, where some of the station's volunteers live and work. The applicant cited demand from its online audience base for access to the service via analog. The power increase will therefore contribute to fulfilling this demand and broaden choice in how the community of interest in the extended area access the service. The licensee provided plans on how it would further engage audiences in the extended areas, noting that the social gain prospects would be greatly enhanced in Kent, Essex, and elsewhere as a consequence of the proposed extended coverage. Specifically, the extended coverage would result in their iconic and historically important radio ship becoming part of the licensed area. This will enable the use of this museum space to serve as an educational tool in offshore radio and an additional education and training resource for potential volunteer radio presenters and technicians, which alongside the studio facilities in Kent will provide additional social gain capabilities. No additional frequency resource is required to extend the service to the community of interest in the extended area. You can listen to Radio Caroline on their internet stream online. Many of the news and information items heard on This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the ARRL Letter, the ARRL Audio News, the Southgate Amateur Radio News Service, Southgate Vibes, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain, and Ofcom, the SARL, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters all across North America and around the world on great repeater systems like our flagship repeater K2RHI on 146.940 MHz, serving the Tri-Cities of New York State's capital region from Mount Refinesk in Brunswick, New York. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated. Now for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jeff Rahner, WB2AEQ, saying 73 until next week. This Week in Amateur Radio is copyright Community Video Associates Incorporated. All rights reserved.